working. Blessed are the people who know the sound of the shofar. In the light of your countenance, so Yahweh shall they walk. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam. Eshir kishyanu b'mvisotov etzivanu, lishmuah chol shofar. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments and has commanded us to hear the voice of the shofar. We just want to welcome everybody here on this awesome Shabbat. Hey, we do just want to thank everybody for being here and all the prayers and all that that's going up. For a lot of our people, exactly, you know, we've been talking about these different mandates and jobs and all of that. Things are happening. So I just keep praying for all of those who are affected and they don't know. I know a lot of things are still up in the air. And uh, just continue to be praying for those, you know, with that. And um, that, you know, the Father... You know, this is, this is one of these things that, like I said, some of us get pushed to the Red Sea. You know, but what is, and this is where discernment comes in. What is the Father trying? To, everybody's different. You know, there's, you just, there's just not one cookie cutter. There's a bunch of them. So the Father is dealing with different ones of us, trying to get some of us to move out in faith and do something a little different. And some of them, you know, He's wanting us to stand our ground and fight through this because He still wants us where we are. So it's still a walk of faith. It's not easy. Um, like we said last week, it's always easier for me to believe healing for somebody else than for myself. You know what I mean? Because it's just, we fight these battles. And, and so for that right there, I just want to uh, just everybody continue to be praying for everybody that has these um, situations this, in their lives with these jobs. And, and the fathers will be glorified in it. And because he, what did David say? He never saw any of his people, the righteous, forsaken or, or begging see, for bread. Begging for bread. Amen. That's right. So just know that that's who we, our trust is in. So, you know, we always talk about where we've seen this before. You know, it's not very many years ago, back in the 1930s, there was a man that rose up, started putting, taking people out of their places, put them in, in uh, neighborhoods. And eventually they ended up into concentration camps. You know, so this is what we've talked about. You know, uh, I know Halisa's here. We've always said this. Every generation, this is one thing that she's mentioned here, and this is one thing that's so important, you got to get it. Every generation has their tribulation. And I just was saying this, when my dad, just as a side note, when my dad, he was born in the 1922, in the very early stages of his life, he walked through tribulation. Even though they were so poor, they didn't know that they were in tribulation. But he walked through it. And his latter years was my early years that were really great years. And now my latter years are looking like his beginning years. So we don't dodge this because we're going to get an opportunity to be able to, are we going to stand on the Torah? Are we going to stand for righteousness sake? And so it doesn't matter where you're born or when you're born, you're going to have opportunity to do this. And it's like you say, you have to fight it. It doesn't matter. The Father is in control, guys. Amen. The, Yahweh's in control. This is not taking Him by surprise. He puts this out here because, and He knows how to put us between two mountains and Pharaoh to get us to go across the Red Sea. He knows how. If we're not going to willingly go, He's saying, I know how to get my people there. And either, because going back is not an option. Whenever Pharaoh showed up, he wasn't taking them back as slaves. He was going to kill them. So you just have to understand that in life, this is the way the Father, he, look, Yahweh is a great general. Can we say that? Yahweh is a great general. He knows, I talked about this when we were up at Jacob's tent. The thing is, is I know that like people like me and people like Halisa and, and, and Bill and all of them, we're on a need-to-know basis only. We don't know everything. But I can tell you that He will reveal it at the right time. But if you don't know the Torah, and this is the thing that, that we've been trying to say here, and she's been saying and Bill's been saying, if you don't know the feast and festivals, if you don't know the Torah, you don't know, understand the Torah portions, because really the book of Revelation, we're in Ephesians, 
I mean, we're in chapter two because we're going through this. Again, it's just if you don't know, you have to say, where have we seen this before? And if you have this, then you see that these things are reoccurring in these generations. And we should be able to look back and, and draw strength from our forefathers where they stood and, and, and it gives us strength to know because it's not going away. It's just that the Father can protect us in the wilderness. He is not going, if He has to feed us with manna, hallelujah, you know, and that's just the way it'll be. We have to trust to know that He has a Goshen for His people, right? And if that is our pattern, and it is, and we see that Israel, the, the sons of Jacob, they went through the first three plagues, you can correct me if I'm wrong, the first three plagues, the same as Egypt did. But from that fourth plague on, they were among it, but they were not affected by it. Amen. That's what I'm kind of looking for. Where is that thing that's coming down on the world that does not affect those who have the testimony of Yeshua and keep the commandments of Yahweh? And then, then we're going to know even better what time frame we're in. And, and like Mark said, without understanding the times and seasons, the feasts and festivals in Shabbat, we're not going to accurately discern like Issachar. And so there's this great opportunity to mix at the end of time when things get, don't mix, don't mix. stand strong, stand pure, because it is a pure and holy people that he is raising up Amen. the cream of the crop to be that remnant that stands at the end time, right? Amen. So there's hope. There's hope. He always, always conceals his people. Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we do just come to you and we just ask, Father, that in this day, Father, we do serve you. You're our creator. This is the day that you have created this Shabbat. Every Shabbat, every feast and festival. Our focus and our prayers and our minds are on you, lifting up Yeshua in this place, not on ourselves. Father, we come here to honor you and to praise you. Father, Yeshua is a great example. He is our great example when he said that I did not come to be served, but I come to serve. And I pray, Father, that we in this place would be stewards and servants to be able to manage your kingdom and to be able to serve in your kingdom. Father, whatever the capacity you have us to serve and to be stewards over. First, we have to be stewards over our homes. And we have to serve there righteously for us to be able to be an example to go outside. So I'm praying, Father, that in this place, Father, that you would be honored and praised today and be glorified. Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our wrongdoings, whether they're sins of omission or commission. Father, that we wouldn't have any kind of hindrances in this place. But Father, that we know, and we just thank you and we praise you for being our great King. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. So if y'all would stand, we'll do the Shema, the Via Hoften, we'll bless our sons and daughters. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Shema Yisrael Adonai Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Ve'ahavta et Yahweh lehecha 
וכל אבוב קור, וכל נפשי קור, וכל מיודי קור, והיו הדברים האלה, אשר אלוקים מספקה היום על דבבי קור, ושנענתם לבני קור, ודיברת בם, ושבתקו בבתקו, ובלקתקו ודרק, ובשק בקור, ובקומי קור, וקשרתם לעוד על ידי קור, והיו לתודפות בין עיני כה, וכתבתא ממוססות בתיקו, ובשורקו, ואהבת לרקו כמוקו. You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Hadassah is going to lead us in prayer. Point your hands to the treasure chest. And say, Abba. Abba. Open their eyes. Open their eyes. To receive your truth. To receive your truth. In Yeshua's name. In Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Let's all point our hands to the treasure chest and all together say, Abba, open their eyes to receive your truth. In Yeshua's name, amen. And all together say, by his grace, not one will be lost. Amen. to the house of the Lord Standing here in your gates Blessing be 
Okay, if y'all would stand, we want to do the blessing of the third portion. And we'll do the Torah blessing and we'll get into our midrash. All together. You shall say before Yahweh your Elohim, I have removed the sacred portion from my house and also have given it to the Levite and the alien, the orphan and the widow, according to all your commandments which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of Yahweh my Elohim. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the ground which you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey, as you swore to our fathers. Amen. Boy, kuad Adonai, humble rock. Baruch Adonai, humble rock, leolam ba'ed. Baruch Adonai, humble rock, leolam ba'ed. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam. Asher b'kav b'nu mikol ha'amim. V'natan l'nu et torato. Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha'torah. Amen. Bless Yahweh the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, O Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Yah, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen and amen. If y'all would, y'all may be seated. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13 too. Uh, what we've done is, is we're in the book of Revelation. Uh, we went there a long time ago, and now we're back to it. Um, I think because of there again, um, what the Father, I believe, is speaking to us. What we're trying to do here is, you know, as we were going last week, we're looking at the good works, as Elisa would put it, the, the good lamp and the wicked lamp. But what you're seeing is, are the good works and the bad works that happens in these seven congregations. I believe that all of these congregations, all seven represent, we represent all seven, not just one of them, but all seven. It's what um, I believe is we're going through these end times and we're looking at what's happening. Now, last week, the I just wanted just to do a little bit of recap. Last week, Ephesus, this is the first one that we're, we're tackling, and they had a lot of good things. We had them listed last week. But he had one thing that, that was a huge problem. They abandoned or they left their first love. I saw something like this, and I reworded this because I really liked what it was saying, but, I, but it just it had something about words and deeds. So I just rewrote it, and it was this. So words and deeds without love grows a garden of weeds. Okay? Words and deeds without love grows a garden of weeds. Lisa talks a lot about it now. I know you're here, so I'm, I'm sorry that you're here, and I'm probably using your name a handful of times. But I have to give her credit because this is what we're doing because I've gone through these workbooks. They're really awesome workbooks. It's just like squid. When you chew it, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Okay? It's just the way it is. I'm sorry. I know squid's unclean, but what can I say? That's just something that grows. That's something that Papa Bill used to say. But here's the thing, and this is why I wanted to go in 1 Corinthians 13, 2. It says this, if I have all prophetic powers, because we have to understand this, when he addressed this congregation first, because Yeshua could have addressed any one of the congregations, but he addresses this one because of the term love. Chapter 13 in, in Corinthians is sandwiched in between the spiritual gifts, the power gifts. And this is what Paul is trying to say here. Yeshua is saying the same thing. You can have good words and you can have powerful, you can be raising the dead, but if you don't have words, all you're going to do is produce weeds. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. If you don't have love, you're just going to produce weeds. This is what he's telling this to the congregation. Because I'm telling you, if you would have looked at the congregation at Ephesus and you saw all the good things, because this is what we need to do. The good part of that lamp, this is what we need to be doing in our life. But he's telling us that there's a big issue. And he's telling us in Revelation, we'll read it, go back there just as we recap. But if you don't have love, he says, I'm going to remove your lampstand. So this is huge. So I'm wanting to show you that as we go through this, because we can, we can end up being in a situation to where we don't allow vengeance is his. 
where we will try to take vengeance and we will try to do things by operating out of the flesh. And we can't do that. We have to trust Him that the Father knows what He's doing. And we said this at the beginning, Yahweh is a great general. He knows what He's doing. But we as foot soldiers, we need to take orders from Him. We don't need to start trying to figure out. We don't need to be a Korah. We don't need to be one of these others. We don't need to be a Judas. We're going to talk about this in just a little bit. We don't need to be one who's trying to tell the leaders, what to do, and especially our Heavenly Father. So he says this, if I have all prophetic powers and understand all mysteries. Now, he didn't say some mysteries. He's telling you, if I understand all mysteries. In other words, I'm it on a stick, okay? That if I have, if I understand all mysteries, that's pretty powerful, and have all knowledge, he's all knowed up. And if I have all faith, that's powerful. As to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Paul has said this to the church at Corinth. Yeshua is telling the church of Ephesus exactly the same thing. Without love, now we can go to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. Like I said, this is a recap of... Four, five, and six. I'll just read it again. It says, But if I have, he said, This I have against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, if you remember in verse one, he talks about he's walking, Yeshua is walking among the congregations today. All over the world, Yeshua is tending His lampstands. We are these lampstands. He's, he's tending His lampstands. So He's there. Satan is also active in the congregation trying to put out. This is what the wicked lamp is about. Proverbs 6, He is out there trying to snuff out the righteous lamps. He's out there. He's trying to snuff out. And so He's doing His part. Yeshua is doing His part. Now what is Yeshua asking us to do? We're to do our part. We are to guard against the enemy because he's showing the bad works. Yeshua's tending. He's going to show through these congregations, these are the things that you're not to do, and these are the things that I'm saying that you're doing great. Keep doing these, but make sure you quit doing these. If you remember, we talked about last week, there's two congregations that didn't have really any negatives. And guess what? Smyrna and Pergamon, what happened? These were the most persecuted of the congregations. Have you ever noticed when you're under heavy persecution, there's not a lot of sin going on in your life? There's a lot of praying, there's a lot of fasting, a lot of interceding when there's great persecution. You know, we said this before, you know, when all the prophecies and all the words came to Moses, whenever they were going to deliver them and deliver them out of Egypt, they were going into Canaan. You don't ever see in there where he said, oh, by the way, we're going to stop by the wilderness on the way. And so whenever Moses and them left Egypt, and they were, I'm sorry, when, yeah, when they left Egypt and they were headed to Canaan, Yahweh turned them around. And he says, I need, I need you to go this way. Well, you know, like I said before, they didn't have text. So Moses wasn't going to be able just to text everybody and email everybody what was happening. When you have two to four million people trying to turn around and I mean you're you're trying to turn around a large group of people going back 12 miles and then going a place because Moses could have argued Moses was the prince of Egypt Moses he knew how to get to Canaan he's probably been there a few times he was responsible probably building a few cities maybe a pyramid or two I don't know but what I'm saying is is they know these were travel routes they knew how to get from point A to point B But to turn around in Yahweh to say, no, stop, go this way, that takes a lot of trust. Because in the flesh, I remember what you told me at the burning bush. I remember what you told me all this time. Now you sort of telling me something a little different. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. In the flesh, it wouldn't make sense. But Moses has dealt with Yahweh enough that he says, you know what, I'm not going to argue with him. If he says, stop, go back and go this way, this is what we're going to do. And so this is why I was saying this up at Jacob's Tent. People like us, we're not privy to all the information. We're on a need-to-know basis only. 
This is the way the Father works with us. He works with me as a pastor that way. He doesn't show me all things. But whenever he needs something done, he reveals it at that time by faith for us to be able to handle whatever's coming up at the time. Because, guys, this is a faith wall. I mean, it's, you, Moses didn't have a Google map. But guess what? Google map's not doing me any good either. You know, Dr. Google don't help. That's right. Rabbi Google don't help. All of that doesn't help. The Father is leading us in this time by faith for our portion. Remember what I said before? So many times what we've done is, is when, we, when I grew up in church, as I call it, we always talked about the past and we always talked about the future, but nobody ever talked about the present. He wants us in the present. He wants us to deal with the, in the generation He placed us in to be able to minister His works and His deeds with love so that we're not, at the end, we don't have a garden full of weeds in our life. We have a garden full of fruit. Amen? Because that's what He's after. Okay. All right, let's go to verse 6. So this is where we're going to pick up this week. But he says this, he says, and I think this is important to me. It might not be important to you, but it was important to me. Because this is some of the things that, that we deal with. Verse 6, he says this, Yet this you have. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Then he tells them, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the congregations. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, that's what we want to eat of, which is in the paradise of Elohim. So the Nicolaitans. So my question is, is in studying, the works of the Nicolaitans, I won't get into a whole lot of detail, but through the commentaries and through a lot of the writers, you know, it was like the, the message or the teachings of Balaam, which is a mixture. It's, it's mixing... Um, and Nicholas, let's go to Acts chapter 6. So the Nicolaitans, there was something that they were doing that he hated, that Yeshua hated, and the, in the church of Ephesus, that the people there, the congregation there, were not buying into. But this is something I wanted to show you here. Not so much about the Nicolaitans, but about Nicholas himself. Verse 1, it says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, there was a complaint by the Hellenists who arose against the Hebrews because of the widows were being neglected in their daily distribution. Okay, I do want to cover this real quick. If you want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, I do want to bring this out. Okay, so here we have Hellenists. Do we know who the Hellenists are? Okay, these are Greeks that are Hebrews, or Greek-speaking Hebrews. Is that pretty much a Hellenist? It's one who, yeah, Greek-speaking Hebrew. But here's the thing. We have Hanukkah coming up, and this was the big problem during the time of the Maccabees, where you had a bunch of Hellenists. You had Hebrews who were raised with Greek. They, they had their outlook. They had their ways. All of these things were happening in them. They didn't just speak Greek. They were, they were acting like Greek. They were, yeah, they had the mindset. The paradigm was that way. But yet, in Acts here, you see where the Hellenists were believing in Yeshua because they were coming here, but they were having an issue because the Hebrews were neglecting them. But it says this because of the widows, and I just wanted to bring this out in Deuteronomy 10, 17, 18, and 19. And it says this, Yahweh your Elohim is the Elohim of all the Elohims and the Master of Masters. Great, mighty, and awesome Elohim who is not partial or takes no bribes. Now I wanted to bring this part out here is... is we can trust our Heavenly Father. It doesn't matter. All people are created in His image. And we are all important to Him. Okay? 
if we have the testimony of Yeshua and we're, we're working with the commandments, we're not perfect, we're learning, all of these things are happening. He says that he is, he is, we have an advocate. Yeshua is our advocate that fights for us. When we mess up, we have to repent. In the, in the congregation of Ephesus, they abandoned their first love. He didn't say, you abandon your first love, you need to get things right. He said what? Repent. See, a lot of times we just, we mess up in life and we forget the repenting part. But we have to repent whenever we understand that we're in sin and we've been sinning. We have to repent. That's what gets us going back on the right track. So here in the book of Deuteronomy, it's going to tell you about how Yahweh in verse 18, He executes justice for the fatherless and the widows and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. So in Acts 6, what they're doing is, is the Hellenists had come against the Hebrews here because of their daily portions were being neglected. What are they saying? Really, they're saying is, is you're not following Torah. Because Torah is saying you're supposed to take care of us. So you see here that he does execute justice for the fatherless, the widow. He loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. So what does he tell us? There's a reason why. Remember, we always, we've been saying this. Where have we seen this before? Love the sojourner, therefore, because what? You were sojourners in the land of Egypt. So it's about remembering that whenever we have Pesach, this is why we retell the story, is that we have to remind ourselves who we are in Him, whether we're natural born or native or we're grafted in, that how we're supposed to conduct ourselves in the kingdom. You don't have to go here. Uh, Y'all can go back to uh, Acts chapter 6, but I just wanted to read James 1. You know this. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religious is what? Worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before Elohim the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction, and sometimes, like I said, I know you're not here, but and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So here what we're seeing is, again, words and deeds without love grows a garden of weeds. Now, we're not at the church of Sardis, but remember the thing about the church of Sardis? They had it going on. It looked like they were the charismatic church that was on fire. It says, you have the reputation of being on fire for him, but you're dead. This is the same thing. They had a lot of works and deeds going on, but they didn't have the love going on. And it says, because of that, you're dead. What I'm saying here for us in this congregation and for those who hear is this, is that we need to take our temperature where we are in this day and time in our life. Because guys, if we're going to be, effe- if we're going to be effective in the lives of people down the road from here, we have to make sure that we're in a position to where we can affect them in the right way. Because if you won't, if you don't, then we're going to affect, you're going to affect them either the right way or the wrong way. And so my heart and my desire is this, is that we will affect people and where a father gets the glory. Guys, we know this. We've been talking about this over and over again. Yahweh knows you love him. But he wants those who don't know him to know that he loves them. That's what he's after. That's why he put it on the Egyptians. He put it on the Egyptians for the Egyptians to know, I'm Elohim, there is no other. I destroyed all of your gods. And I destroyed you, Pharaoh, who called yourself a god. Yahweh is a jealous Elohim. He will destroy anything and anybody that considers themselves gods before him. And so what is he trying to tell us? That we need to make sure that we don't try to grab the status of a god. You know, trying to say, because I don't want to stand before Yeshua and said, you said, I said, what? You know what I'm saying? So we need to be to where we take our temperature as we go through this study. So we see how are we treating the widows and orphans. So now let's keep going back in Acts 6. I'm sort of shotgunning this because I had a lot to cover. Verse 2, he said, So the twelve summons the full number of the disciples and said, 
it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of Elohim to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from them you how many people? Seven. Seven of good repute. In other words, this has respect, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Then he says in verse 4, because he's, they, we need to devote ourselves to prayer and ministry. So then in, in verse 5, he says this. So they pick these guys. They pick Stephen. They pick Philip. Now, I don't know how to say all these names. So, Prochorus, Nicander, uh, Timon, and I'm saying it just like I was on here, uh, Perminus and Nicholas. Now, this is what we said at the very beginning a couple of weeks ago. Look what it says about Nicholas. Nicholas was a what? He was a proselyte. He's not like the rest of them. Here's one who is a proselyte. He doesn't have any kind of Hebrew blood in him at all because he's a proselyte. The other ones, it didn't say that they were proselytes, so you probably have to where these were probably Hellenists. They probably, because we know, now like Philip here, Philip, this Philip is the one who was preaching or ministering to the Ethiopian. But there was another Philip who was the disciple of Yeshua. That's not the same guy. This is a different one. So you see that there's not a whole lot in history about these guys. There's a few things like whenever they were martyred and some of the things like Stephen, he believed, I believe that they said Stephen, let me see if I can find my little notes, my little cheat sheet. I don't know where I put it. Stephen was martyred. Okay, like Prochorus, it said that he looks like that he might be the nephew of Stephen. So a lot of these guys probably knew each other. But Nicholas, there was something happening in his life to where for him to be chosen, he was pretty fired up. He must have been pretty active, you know, witnessing and doing what he needed to do for the gospel of Yeshua. Or they wouldn't have chose him, but they chose him. In Matthew 10, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to tell you the story. In Matthew 10, Yeshua chose 12. And we know the 12, at the beginning of the 12, Peter was number one. Who was number 12, would you imagine? Judas. And in here, there's seven picked. The first one was Stephen, and the last one was Nicholas. These little patterns show up of how first and last? What's the situation with Judas? He was chosen. We can read here, but in, in, in Matthew 10, they were anointed. Judas was like everybody else. He had the power that was given him to lay hands on the sick, to cast out demons. He had the work of the ministry in his life because it said all of them. It didn't say all but him had the power of the Father moving through him. Nicholas, Judas started a good race. You can probably say it like that. But it didn't end good. But Nicholas could have started a good race, but then all of a sudden something happened to him to where the teachings of Balaam or this mixture of these polytheism entered back into evidently down the road. And the, there's a guy named Arrhenius. I think that's how you say his name in the second century, talked about Nicholas and the Nicolaitans. They had a mixture. And so they had, so he was starting to mix the Greek gods back into Yeshua. So the polytheism and knowing that Yeshua and Yahweh is the only Elohim, he started waning in his teachings there. And so you see that even here in the first century with the church of Ephesus and in Pergamon, I believe it was the other one, that he said, I hate the works of the Nicolaitans. So evidently, if they call them the Nicolaitans, and it's my understanding that it comes from this particular one of the seven of all the research that I've done. So think about this. Moses had Korah. Yeshua had Judas. The congregations had Nicholas. And we got all of them. And yeah, we got Biden. But what happens is, think about this. We have Moses. Do we not? We have Moses. We have Moses and the prophets. We have Yeshua, the witness. And we have the seven congregations that he ministered to. But at the same time, we have Korahs 
and we have Judas's, and we have the Nicolaitans. And this is why this story is so important in our life that we have to discern that Korah didn't just happen during the time. The spirit of Korah lives on. This is why the wicked lamp, this is what Elise is talking about in Proverbs 6, this is why the wicked lamp is alive today. It's alive today and it's moving amongst the good lamp. Trying to deceive is a, it's a, it's a dark light. It's a false light. Satan comes around masquerading himself as an angel of light. So what did he do? He picked one. He picked Korah back in that day. But not only did Korah, Korah couldn't do it by himself. So what did he do? We, we know this. Dathan and Abiram, why did he pick these two? Remember, because they were Reubenites. They had an axe to grind. You're going to go grab somebody that you know. You're not going to go pick some. You're going to pick somebody that's got a chip on his shoulder. This is what you do. You go, you try to grab somebody that you're going to partner with, especially if you're going to try to overthrow somebody. Judas. Judas didn't like the way that the thing was going. But you know what? Peter didn't like it either. Whenever Yeshua says that I'm going to die... He says, oh, no, you're not. And he said, what? Get behind me, Hasatan. Because what you're doing is, is you don't know, you're not discerning. But right before that, he says, who, does, who do you say that I am? You're, you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. But it, he told him something. He says, spirit and blood didn't reveal it to you, right? It, it, I mean, uh, it, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, but my spirit revealed it to you. So guess what, guys? If the Spirit's not revealing to us, that's why it says, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what? What the Spirit is saying. The Spirit revealed it to Peter that he was the Messiah, but it wasn't right next to it. He operated in the flesh and says, No, you're not going to do what Yahweh tells you to do. That's really what he was saying when he says, and he had to say, Get behind me because you don't understand what the will of Yahweh is i got to come as Ben Yosef first, and then I'll come as David later. You don't, everybody wanted David to come because they were under Roman rule. They were, what do we want today? If, if, we're, if we're in prison and if we have a, a ruler down on us, we're always wanting David to show up. We don't need Joseph. We only need Joseph if, there, if, there's, a, if there's a food shortage. That's when we need Joseph. We don't need him when we got the iron fist of Rome on us or his little feet with clay and the ten toes, that mixture, which has a lot to do with, I believe, the Nicolaitans, this mixture of all this stuff. Guys, this is why this is so important. I won't have time to get there, but Acts 19, I'll just tell you the story. Because you could read, I need you to read Acts 19. Here's what Paul was doing. Paul shows up at Ephesus, and this is the reason why I chose Acts 19, was because of Ephesus. He shows up to Ephesus. Now, there is a temple in Ephesus, and it's the temple of who? Artemis, okay, which is a Greek goddess. And Diana is the Roman counterpart, because I guess Rome had to be better, so they had to change the name to protect the innocent. I don't know, so he, she gets the name Diana, but it's the same goddess, the goddess of the hunt, you know, our fertility, and, you know, they usually have a lot going on with them. Do you know that even the, the temple of Artemis, remember we, we talked about the seven wonders of the world? It's, it's listed there. And these were a lot of things that were listed way back in the 5th century B.C. Remember we talked about the hanging gardens of Babylon. You read about it, a lot of people will say that the hanging gardens of Babylon didn't really exist. But I think they did exist. Because you have some other historians that quoted and talked about the hidden gardens of Babylon. Or, I'm sorry, the hanging gardens of Babylon. The hanging gardens of Babylon. But do you know that whenever the hanging gardens of Babylon, when it talked about when they were there, was 605 B.C.? Do you know who showed up into Babylon in 605 B.C.? Daniel and the Hebrews. And I said, I believe it now. Because whenever, whenever Yahweh shows up, beauty starts happening out of ashes. 
Because when I see what they went through, 604, you see 603, you start seeing five, in the 580s and all this, it's whenever the Hebrew children went into the, the, furning, uh, the fiery furnace. You see all of these things happening, and I thought, man, that is, in, in the, in, out of the seven wonders, the hanging gardens of Babylon is there. At the exact same time that Daniel and all the Hebrews showed up. Quinky dink? I don't think so. I'm just saying that this is, to me, it's amazing. But here you have a seven wonders of the world, and it's not a wonder to me. And it's not a wonder to us because we don't have... But what made this important to us today? Because in chapter 19, you have Demetrius, you have these different ones, because Paul was going in, he was saying, there is no other Elohim but Yahweh Elohim. And finally, it got to the place, guys, Ephesus, remember, we're talking about Ephesus was like number two epicenter of the world. There were a port city. We're talking about 250,000 people believed to be in that city during that time in that century. We're talking a lot of money. I got down here, follow the money. You want to know the mark of the beast? You better follow the money. What are they doing today? What is the mandate? How do they get you to do a mandate? Money. It's how, you get, how do they force you to do anything? How does anybody force anybody to do anything? How would they force anybody 65 and older to do anything? Tell them that they're going to take away what? Social Security. Can you see my eyes? So I won't say anything that's not kosher. I want you to think about something. Think about this. Social Security... Somebody just, I want you to help me with Social Security just a minute. Because I'm not that smart. Now, I'm 62. I got that part right. I've been paying Social Security for a lot of years. Okay? Whose money was that? Yeah, it was ours. That my money. They took my money... And put it so that whenever I get, no, and that's a lie, but they're taking my money to pay my dad's, and now my dad's gone, they're taking my money still today, I still pay it, to help those that are retired. That way that whenever I get there, they're going to take all of you kids' money and give it to me. <laughs> I appreciate it. I want to thank you all right now for all that you're going to do for me in a few years. If he doesn't return. And that would be the joke. Yeshua would return right when I would be able to sign up. Okay. <laughs> Amen. But I would have a better retirement with him. Amen. Than I would with the other. Ching, ching. So I love that. So think about this. So now you want to try to tell me I can't get it unless I get the jab. You're going to get the jab. But you're going to get the jab. Because people ain't going to stand for that. That's wrong because it ain't your money, big dog. That ain't your money. Because if they don't vote you in next year, guess what? You out. But they act like all of that's theirs. It ain't theirs. Social Security is yours. It come out of your paycheck. It's separate. And the taxes, it's separate. And it's set aside because they're saying that we're too dumb to save. And that we can't manage our money, so they're going to do it for us. Am I missing this? No, I don't think so. That's what they're doing. I'm just putting it in layman's terms. This is what's happening. But then, but guys, follow the money. Follow the money. We have to understand that in these seven congregations, when it comes down to it, the mark of the beast... The mark of the beast, they tell you one thing about the mark of the beast is about what? You can't do what? Buy or, buy or sell. You can't get this or we're going to take this or whatever. We got to be, we got to be smart to understand and know what's happening. In our day that we have, during the 40s, I'm sorry, during the 30s, Hitler and them took the Jews and they took their what? Their businesses. 
they had a lot of to where they couldn't buy or sell. And then they took them. Look, all it takes is one nutcase to be able to get into a place of rulership and turn around and say, I'm boss. I want all the Congress. I want all the senators. I want all of whatever you call them in whatever country it is to give me the authority to say this. And that's dangerous. And if we don't know history, that's what Hitler did. If you want me to rebuild you to a powerful place, you need to give me all authority. Did, not, did that not happen a few years ago in China to where um, Zing or Zach or Z-I, whatever, how you say his name, I don't whoever, is she, okay? Did he not do that? He did that. Now he has the power to tell them what to do. Guys, that's dangerous, but we better wake up. I think Putin did the same thing. You know what I'm saying? He did the same thing. You keep doing this, this is all set up. These people aren't stupid. This is by design. Now, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers. These are the principalities and powers being set up, but they take their orders from Hasatan himself on the dark side. That's the wicked lamp. That's what they do. And this is how you are to, this is why I'm so excited about your books. Your workbooks are just so full because it helps us today recognize the enemy. Because what happens is They drug Paul out into the streets because these people, they come up and said, hey, look, guys, this dude who don't even belong here comes in here and he's teaching. I don't mind him teaching that Yahweh's his Elohim. I'll make a little statue of him. Bobblehead, whatever, he, whatever figurine you need. We'll sell him and we'll make profit. Give me an image. Is he the God of plenty? Is he the God of tangerines? What's he the God of? We'll hang something off of him. We'll give him a bow. We'll give him a wing. We'll do. What is he? We'll, man, we'll make some money off of him. They don't care. The problem is, is you're saying even Artemis, you're saying Artemis is no good, and man, that ain't going to fly here. And they, they rose up. Why did they rise up? Did they rise up because of Paul's Elohim? No. They didn't care if he had one. He messed with their pocketbooks because of all of their, all of their artisans, all of the things that they were doing. And this is what happens today. Abortion. When you come against abortion, the, the issue is not to them, it's not that you're killing a baby. It, you're killing their business. They have, they have a bit, we're talking a multi-billion dollar business. That's what they're not wanting to give up. Follow the money. Now, I will tell you something in Revelation 13. Well, we're not there by long shot. But there's two beasts. These two beasts will be destroyed. But there's something that I don't think you'll ever destroy until Yeshua comes, and that's the image of the beast. The image, because it's an image. And the image, as long as we have these images and the image and the image, that's a fight. We have, to have, we have to have the Torah and we have to have the testimony of Yeshua fluently in our life. Because if not, the image will draw you away to a wicked lamp side. That's just what it does. Because it doesn't want us having the testimony. How many times do we go through, Hanukkah's coming up. What did Antiochus Epiphany say that you will do? You will get rid of the Torah. You will get rid of the times and seasons. You're going you're gonna to eat what we tell you to eat. We're going to water, 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 whatever. And do you know what? And if you don't do it, we're going to take you Social Security. We're going to take, we're going to take what? Your livelihood. 
That's what, in every one of these situations, you have to understand this. Can now I say this? And I want, I want to make this very clear. We in this congregation don't tell you to get or not to get a vaccine. I don't do that. That's you, your, this is you. For your children, we've been dealing with this ever since we was homeschooling. Do you vaccinate or not vaccinate? This is nothing new, okay? I don't get into that. This is your family, and your, I just want you to know this right off the bat. But I do believe this. Forget what it is as for the actual little bitty liquid in a bottle. Forget that. It's the power of somebody that can tell you what to do. That can tell you that you can put something in your body that you're saying, I don't want in my body. Because you, you have the abortion people saying, my body's mine. But that don't work for me. Why does it not work for me? When you have a, when you have a lady says, my body is my body. Well, my body is my body. My body, my choice. It works for one, it don't work for the other. Because of the money. It's because of the money. Look, pharmacy, pharmacia. Now, we talked about this at the very beginning too. It's the abuse of pharmacia because pharmacia comes from witchcraft. I'm not saying a leave is witchcraft. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, 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 it's the, the, the wickedness and the witchcraft of it and what it's doing in all of the drugs and all of the stuff, yes, it is. It's, it's the witchcraft of it. But what is the biggest part? Follow the money. Who do these drug people, how do I call them? Drug in, pharmaceutical companies, companies. That's right, help me out there a little bit. I was going to say Moderna and Pfizer and all of them, and I was going get, to get them all crossed up. Johnson and Johnson and, you know, uh, Hostetler and Hostetler and all these pharmacia groups. Okay, so anyway, so what happens? Follow the money. So what do you have is politicians. The senators of Rome. <laughs> okay, whatever. So what do they do? What do these groups do? They donate lots and lots of money to these people so that these people will write policies to pay them back. Guys, that's just the way it works. We're not sugarcoating this. This is just the way our society works. This is why I wanted to read the first part in Deuteronomy. Yahweh is a just Elohim. He does not take bribes. He's not influenced by your money. He's only influenced by your love that produces works and deeds that's going to grow a garden of fruit. That's what he's moved by. And if, and he, because he will tell us we can have all the works and deeds. We can be a fig tree, but fig tree with no figs is not good. Because he wants, and what produces the figs from the fig tree? Love does. And this is why we're a community. This is why community is so important. This is why he wants communities all over the world is so that we can bear fruit and share it with one another because that's what we're going to be doing in the kingdom. It's always been about that. It's not ever changed. It's not about power. Power and pride and all of that stuff, money and all of that. Guys, that's going to, it's not going to be good in the end for those people. It's just not. Because he's telling us, and I'm going to close with this, where should mine and your treasure be? Laid up in the big vault in the sky, if you want to put it that way. But in other words, our treasure is in for the kingdom that's ahead of us, not in this kingdom that's here now. Yeshua said, I didn't come to be served, I come to serve. Guess what our mandate is? We are servants in this earth. We are stewards. We are to manage His kingdom and we are to serve in His kingdom. That's our mandate today. And if He calls you to be King David, King David served Israel. He was never to be served. He was to serve a people. He was to write a Torah for himself so that he would remember that he's not God, that he's not Elohim, that Yahweh's in control 
And Yahweh sets up everybody. Whether you're royalty or not, Yahweh sets everybody up in this world. It's just the way we are. And then we can maneuver and we can be and we can operate in that. And whatever He has for us. I said I was going in just a second ago, but I'm going to do this one right here. Did he, not, did he not, I know this is the second landing. Did he not give some five talents, some two, some one? Okay, that's just the way it works. But do you know what? If he gives you five, you produce five more. He gives you one, you produce one more. Guess what? Same percentage. You can't stand up and glow like a glow worm. Remember we used to have them things, you squeeze that thing, light up. What? I dated some of you guys with this glow worm thing. The other ones, well, what's a glow worm? But you, but you see what I'm saying? What I'm saying is, is five, five, two, two, one is one. If he only gives you one talent, multiply the one talent. And he's going to bless you with a hundredfold because that's the way it is. It's about percentage. It's not that, well, I got one. He only gave me one. He only gave me one. Why did he give me one? He don't like me. He gave Tammy five, gave me one. I'm her helpmate. I thought she was my helpmate. Man, they got this egg connexo, eggs there connecto. They got that thing all backwards, Alan. You know what I'm saying? So we, do we not do that? Do we not do that as body of believers sometimes? We get to a place to where we say, why did he give me this? Well, you know what? Produce what you need to do because if you don't, he's going to take what he gives to you and give to another. And that's what you don't want. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this portion. And I just pray here that we would understand that words and deeds without love does not produce what you desire to be produced in our life. So, Father, I just pray as we go through these congregations that we will do the good and we will correct the bad. And, Father, that we will ever have these etched in our minds and our hearts that as we're confronted in these days and times ahead and even in the present that we are now, that, Father, that we need to be focused all the time not on the hard times of persecution, but on the times of plenty that you give us that we still need to be focused on you and not get lazy and lay down and just take time out. But Father, that we will always be in a sense, Father, of urgency, even though we can have shalom and peace in the urgency. That Father, that we know that any moment you can open that Red Sea and we'll have a path of escape. But Father, while we're here, while we're going through what we're going through as a nation, and also our loved ones who happen to be in other countries, Father, I just lift them up to You. And I pray, Father, that You would give them the understanding to be able to see Your hand in this time that we're in. And not look at all of the symptoms that's going on, but to see the hand of Elohim in what You're doing. Because this does not take you by surprise. So Father, we thank you. We bless you this day. Bless your people. Continue to bless us in this Shabbat. Even the Torah portions that's coming later with Halisa, Father, anoint that because it's going to be awesome. So Father, we thank you. We bless you. Bless this food that we're fixing to eat. I know it's going to be awesome too. In Yeshua's name, and everybody says, Amen and Amen. Thank you guys. Let's say it all together. Sound the great shofar for our freedom. Raise the banner to gather our exiles and gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Praised are you, O Yahweh, who gathers in the dispersed of your people, Israel. Amen. Amen. A great awakening. All right. Prayer for the United States of America all together. Abba, Father, giver of life, we pray for and entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock on which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of life, liberty, and blessings. We cry out for this land to be reclaimed for your glory. May it be that you will dwell among your people. 
Send your spirit to touch and open the hearts of our nation and its leaders to seek your will and your ways. Grant us the ability and courage to stand for the truth, and may we be that righteous nation you have called us to be. We ask this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Psalm 122, we'll do the prayer for the peace of Jerusalem once Lisa gets in place. All together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of Yahweh, an ordinance for Israel, to give thanks to the name of Yahweh. For there thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of Yahweh our Elohim, I will seek your good. Amen. The ironic benediction. Ya er er nai panavaleka vikuneko Ye saw er nai panavaleka ve yasam leka shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you Amen May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you Amen May Yahweh lift his countenance upon you and give you shalom and peace Amen And it's time again for the kiddish the blessing over the wine Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei pri hagafen, Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And the blessing over the bread. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh or Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. It is Shabbat. Thank the Lord. It is Shabbat. 